From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where yours truly is racing in Mexwork, the Mexican Ocean Racing Circuit. People ask all the time, what's new in sailing? And no one could speak to that issue better than our guest today, Gary Jobson, America's Cup winner, president of U.S. Sailing. And this week, he will host the Rolex Yachtsman and Yachtswoman Awards from the St. Francis Yacht Club on March 24th. So, Gary, you're about to host the Rolex Yachtsman of the Year Awards at the St. Francis Yacht Club. Talk a little bit about that process. So the uh, Rolex Yachtsman and Yachtswoman of the Year Awards dates back to 1961. Although back at that time, they had a different sponsor and Rolex picked up the sponsorship in 1980. An award goes to the individual. Occasionally it's two <laughs> when people sail together, but it goes to the individual who's had extraordinary uh, performances on the water in a calendar year. And so this year it's for 2021. We did not name a Rolex Yachtsman or Yachtswoman of the Year in 2020 because of COVID, we simply didn't have any sailing to reference, but here we did. And there's a panel that nominates a group of people and then a different panel, there's two, one of journalists and one of past winners that boils it down to the top three men and the top three women. I don't know who's won, uh, that's not announced, but I get to open the envelope, <laughs> which will be at St. Francis Yacht Club at a dinner uh, this coming Thursday. And I look forward to it. I've hosted this event now for a lot of years, over 30, and it's always great fun. And the highlight are two things. One, interviewing the finalists, where I'll interview uh, each of the three finalists and then the speech by the winner. And uh, we don't know, they don't know, and we'll find out on Thursday and it's gonna be great fun. Tell me, what is new in sailing? You know better than anybody. Well, there's certainly a lot going on and there's some uh, confusion around the waterfront and we're kind of in an, a time of transition and happily for me, my time at the leadership of US Sailing is over. And my time on the leadership, the board of world sailing is over, but I follow it closely and talk to lots of people. And I try not to bestow my uh, opinion, but people ask for items. So what's new? So when I say we're in a transition time, there's a bunch of things happening. Take handicap offshore racing. Where are we today? I think Stan Honey told me at one point, there's 18 different handicap rating rules in use around the world. And here in the US, I think we have about four or five that we use. And it's confusing to a boat owner. Which rule do I use? Uh, how do I best maximize my performance on the water? Uh, if you're a race organizer, well, which one do we promote and which one do we use? Or is there more than one that we should have for an individual race? U.S. sailing, uh, frankly, was a little bit dormant in this area uh, in recent years, but happily over the last six months or so, the offshore committee and the management of U.S. sailing has uh, picked up the baton and hired some new people and taken a good hard look at what do we do with offshore rating and uh, try and consolidate it so we're universal with one, maybe two rules. There's quite a dynamic in this country between the professional and amateur sailor. World sailing is the one that defines who is an amateur and who is a uh, professional. And professionals uh, certainly change the dynamic on the water with their boat and how they sail and how they push people. And I don't think we've really come to grips on how we should handle it. Awards are given out for amateur crews. Awards are given out for uh, open crews or professional crews. And I think that too needs a little bit better definition. Happily, we're seeing more women in the sport of sailing. Uh, we've achieved gender equity in the Olympics, Paris 2024. 
the Olympic Games, which is actually going to be down on the coast um, in Marseille. I've sailed there, good place for sailing. And we will have 175 male athletes, 175 female athletes, so the quotas are the same, and equal medals for both men and women in the games. And there are a couple classes where we have mixed crews in the NACRA 17 and the uh, 470 class. There'll be one man, one woman, and it uh, doesn't matter who steers. Uh, you can make an argument that you want the taller person out on the wire on a 470 or a NACRA. Um, so I'm sure we'll see a, a variety of uh, people racing with either men or women steering. So that's pretty good for our sport. It sends a good message. And I think the America's Cup would do well to uh, be a little bit more versatile with women on the boats because there were zero females sailing in Auckland in 2021 and zero females on the boat in Bermuda in 2017. And, uh, and there were none on the boats in 2013 when the cup was in San Francisco. So maybe you ought to mandate every boat has two women just to start it off. So, but gender equity across the board is good. I, I see more women joining yacht clubs and acquiring boats and uh, being out there in the water. So I find that kind of intriguing. This week, the Sail GP will be racing in San Francisco Bay. And as we learned during the America's Cup back in 2013, San Francisco Bay is a great place for the America's Cup. You know, Generally, you can count on pretty strong winds. The current adds a capricious element to it all. And standing anywhere on the couple miles there on the waterfront is special. You know, I, I remember a lot of years ago, Tom Blackhaller, our dear friend, our departed friend, he was an advocate of, why don't they put the America's Cup in catamarans? You know, they go faster. And uh, if you want a great place for racing catamarans, put it on San Francisco Bay. And I, I think Tom is up in the heavens looking down saying, they got it right. You know, they put the America's Cup there in 2013. And the Sail GP, uh, you know, very fast. Boats um, will be racing really? uh, on San Francisco Bay. We haven't seen racing there at this level uh, since 2013, really. I mean, there's a lot of racing on the bay, but not this kind of stuff. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be out there and I look forward to watching it. So that that's kind of new and exciting. Another positive trend that I'm seeing around the country is junior and youth sailing. We have over 500 high schools with uh, varsity sailing teams now. And at the last count I had, there were 214 colleges that either had a varsity sailing team or a team that competed at the same level, but as a club, depends on the college or university. And that's really bodes well. And then junior programs, uh, the rosters at clubs are booked here in Annapolis, where I live, Annapolis Shot Club. We had 700 spots in a variety of programs for kids of all ages, ranging from, I think, six years old up to about 17 years old. And there was an elaborate system of lining up online and it opened at nine o'clock Eastern on February 1st. And I think the whole thing sold out in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so, and I, I have, we, we have, uh, we put four of our grandkids in the program and my wife and I each had two computers set up and I was a nervous wreck making sure we got them signed up. But we, we, we within the first six minutes, we had all four of them. So junior sailing looks good. U.S. sailing is addressing offshore sailing. The dynamic between a pro and offshore, we need to work a little bit more on. And then finally, uh, as I travel around the country, I see boats on the water. Last weekend, I spoke in Austin, Texas and in Houston, Texas, kind of Saturday and Sunday. And there were plenty of boats out sailing. And uh, after the races, I talk to people and you learn a lot of new people getting into the sport and intrigued by our sport and getting out there. So I think all of us should try to get somebody that hasn't sailed before or novice crews out in the water and let them steer a little bit, open their eyes and uh, get people out there in the water. So those are some of the things that are new. Now, one, one more thing, and we can talk about this a little bit. 
I have two books coming out this calendar year, 2022. The first is on the 100th anniversary of the e-scout class. The e-scout class uh, was formed in 1923. So next year, 2023 uh, is the 100th anniversary. So late this year, the book will come out. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And then a second book that I've been quietly chipping away at, and I'm happy to report the writing phase is over. The editing phase is about two weeks from being over, and then we'll go to layout and put images. And the name of this book is The Characters of the America's Cup. And I selected 50 people dating back to 1851 with John Cox Stevens, who was one of the engines behind the Yacht America and also founded the New York Yacht Club, all the way up to present day. I think the most recent character I have included in the book is Grant Dalton from New Zealand. And Ron, you and many of our uh, listeners here will know many of the characters from San Francisco. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you that Tom Blackhaller is one of the characters in the book. Another is Paul Kayard, who had uh, fascinating careers in the America's Cup and from California. Dennis Connor is uh, one of the characters. Malin Burnham, who was such an instrumental part of the Cup are included. And there's a lot of names people have never heard of. You know, if I, if I mention the name Charles Oliver Islin, very few sailors will ever have heard about him. 1886? Yeah, well, Oliver, well he, he came on in 1893 and he was part of six America's Cup campaigns. He owned two boats that defended the cup. He skippered them and he was owner of the boat. And then four more cup campaigns, he was the manager putting these teams together. And I kind of think, boy, we could use a Ali Islin right now, <laughs> you know, because this guy would put together a team and, and think about this team. So he, he needs some money. So he gets JP Morgan to fund it. He needs a skipper. So he gets the great Charlie Barr to steer it. He needs a designer and a builder. So he gets Nathaniel Green Harrishoff to design and build the boat. I think Harrisoff, Morgan, and Barr. Now that, <laughs> that is a dream team if there ever was one. And, and, uh, and they defended the America's Cup three times, uh, which is quite a story. And then there, there's people uh, that maybe you've heard of, but their stories are so compelling, like Thomas Octave Murdoch Sopwith. He challenged for the Cup twice. He came very close in 1934. He lost four to two in a somewhat contentious series, but he was really an aircraft manufacturer that thanks to him, he basically saved Britain at the end of World War I and repelled the Germans with his Sopwith Camel and a variety of aircraft that he built that I learned is they were hard to fly, but they were faster and more maneuverable than the German aircraft and it saved Britain in the Battle of Britain for sure. And Sopwith was that guy and between wars, he challenges for the America's Cup twice. Or Sir Thomas Lipton. I mean, this guy challenged five times. He, what a story. You know, he, he, he Irish. He, his family had a grocery store. And Tommy Sopwith in his 20s says, boy, these grocery stores are terrible. They're dirty. They're dark. You can't buy anything. I got to get people to come in. So he gets good lighting in the stores. Really nice graphics fresh produce, and one commodity everybody in the UK and Ireland had was tea. And the tea was all over the map and expensive and unreliable and never knew he was going to ship it. So he goes and uh, buys a couple plantations in Ceylon, which I think is now Sri Lanka, and starts manufacturing tea, and he makes it inexpensively for the consumer and reliable, Lipton tea. And he used the America's Cup to promote his Lipton tea. And I'm not sure he really wanted to win because he wanted to keep challenging. And he was very popular around the waterfront. Uh, he was gay and he kept that a secret. He had a lover uh, for 40 years, a guy named William Love. And uh, reporters would say, yeah, we're going to get married. And he said, well, I haven't found the right woman yet. Okay. <laughs> and they would leave him alone. But, but you know, and he bestowed... <clears throat> Lipton Cups all over the United States. And I think after uh, the fourth cup, 
the American public took a little pity on Sir Thomas and uh, uh, a writer in New York organized uh, a cup for him and people donated, you know, whatever they could, pennies and dollars and ten dollars and they got a good fun together and presented Thomas Lipton with his own cup. <laughs> so, and then and stop with, so think about this. So he's a little bit of a rich kid. His father uh, managed and I think owned some mines up in Scotland. Uh, Tommy Sopwith is 10 years old. His father takes him bird hunting one morning and the hunt is over and they're riding back in the horse born, uh, horse um, drawn buggy. And the young boy, 10 years old, is playing with his gun. The gun goes off and he kills his father. Wow. And for the rest of his life, and he lived to 102 years old. He's trying to prove himself to the father. And that, and he was the first European to get a license from the Wright brothers to experiment with aircraft. And, and he says, you know, he crashed a few times, uh, you know, probably up 50 feet or something in these little craft. But, you know, what a genius. And, and he came remarkably close to winning the America's Cup. He was up two to O oh and he got out Fox by uh, another character I wrote about, uh, Charles Sherman Hoyt, whose uncle was the war general, Tecumseh Sherman, um, that torched Atlanta during the Civil War. That was his uncle. And uh, young Sherman was a great sailor, naval architect, uh, designer, and uh, I don't think he had to work too hard. But in, at the age of 56, he's the tactician aboard Rainbow in 1934 America's Cup. They're down 2 to 0. They round the leeward mark in the third race, 15 miles downwind, 15 miles upwind. So kind of strange course downwind, then upwind. And they're six minutes and 38 seconds behind at the leeward mark. And Vanderbilt's kind of upset. He can't fathom going down 3 to 0 to Sopwith. So he hands over the helm to 56-year-old Sherman Hoyt and says, all right, Mr. Hoyt, let's see what you can do. So Sherman Hoyt starts pinching up and pinching up. Of course, when you pinch, you go slower, but he's climbing height. And the wind had shifted, so they're aimed right at the finish line, which is now about 12 miles away, over the horizon. They can't see it. It's a misty day off Newport, Rhode Island. No Loran, no GPS, no radar, all piloting. And Sopwith is nervous. Why are they going up so high? We better go cover. And sure enough, Sopwith covers, cross, uh, tacks over to cover. By now, all the crew and lighter wind laying on the leeward deck, including Vanderbilt, who came back up on deck. Nobody's saying a word. Nobody's looking at the other boat. And Sopwith crosses ahead, keeps going, tacks to windward. But now they're windward and behind. Zenus Bliss, the navigator on Rainbow, is telling Sherman Hoyt, hey, we got to bear off. The mark is down. It's eight miles to leeward. No way, man. He keeps pinching up, and he makes Sopwith pack away again. And Sopwith goes about three minutes and finally tacks back. And when he tacks back to port, Sherman Hoyt bears off 30 degrees, aim for the finish line, and wins the race by two minutes and 30 seconds. And Sopwith was so upset and the crew so disjointed, they didn't win again and Rainbow defended the cup four to two. Great story. And this book is just filled with little things like that. So Gary, what number are these books? You've written so many. Yeah, 2020, 20, books number 22 and 23. Uh, if you look over my shoulder, uh, that row there, those are the books that I've written in my career. And the, the odd thing about books is halfway through, I scratch my head and say, why did I say I would do this? This is really hard and endless. But then the book comes out and it's in your hands and it feels so good. So I've been through that 21 times. And um, actually, I, I'm not sure. I, maybe the character's book will come out a little bit before the eScout book, but they'll be both out this calendar year. And, and if I can make a comment about e-scouts, it's rare for a class to 
last for 100 years and actually be more vibrant today than when they first came out. But the e-scout story is very compelling to me. And there's one thing that the class elders did when the class came out that really made a difference and is the reason the boat has survived 100 years and I'm convinced is going to survive well into the future. So yes, it's very fast. It's great fun to sail. It's a wonderful family boat and lots of families, you know, uh, race together. And so it, it has all those elements. Uh, I think it used to be affordable. No boats are affordable today, but it is certainly get good value and they're easy boats to move around. But here's the cool thing. So the East Gal was uh, envisioned to be a one design class, which was pretty unique in 19... 23. So the East Cow is a 28 foot long boat. It weighs about 965 pounds, so very lightweight. It's got a tremendous amount of sail area. And the cool thing about the East Cow is it evolves with the time. So here's the procedure. So say you have an idea that you think might get the boat going faster. So you uh, apply to the class and say, I have an idea and I'd like to use it this coming season. And the class will either approve it or not approve it. Usually they do. But your scores won't count. But you get to race anyway. And at the end, you'll either reject the idea. Well, that was a bad idea. I'm not going to do that. Or, boy, this has got legs. And uh, you apply to class and they'll debate it. And often these ideas become reality. More recent years, they went to a uh, spade rudder. They went to asymmetrical spinnakers. Uh, they got kind of a big lever boom bang. Uh, some years ago, they went to a, what I would call a soling mass, not a rotating mass. And each time the boats are better. But as you can imagine, there's always a lot of uh, debate slash controversy around it. Because yes. there was a lot of resistance to asymmetrical spinnakers. Why do you want to do that? The spinnaker pole is good, and we, we like the way we race. Of course, the asymmetrical spinnakers were easier to handle. The boats went faster. They were safer. Uh, more women got on the boats. You didn't have to handle the spinnaker pole. And after uh, about a year and a half of furious debate, they adopted asymmetrical. And I don't think anybody's going back to symmetrical spinnakers. So it, it, it's just a great story of why this class has thrived. And, and I think other classes probably could uh, use example. East Gals are sailed primarily in the Midwest and uh, New Jersey and New York. They um, are best in smoother water, not so much in the chop. So it might be tough off Newport, Rhode Island or even San Francisco Bay. Although I think an East Gal in San Francisco Bay would be cool. So Gary, I learned to sail on an eight foot, four inch home built kit boat, which was a scow. We called it the scow because there were so few scows, very few uh, on San Francisco Bay at the time. And uh, we beat the moth, we beat the snipe, we beat the blue jays, we beat all these other boats around because the darn thing was so fast. And um, it was really fun. One time when I was uh, 13, a bigger kid named Erwie Whippard, uh, flipped it and got it right upright, right in front of uh, my buddy Bob and South and I. And we, and we said, he didn't get his socks wet. Look, he didn't get his socks wet. And that became kind of a big mantra for us young kids at the time. Can you flip the boat? So pretty soon, actually, part of the race would be you had to flip a boat and bring it back out. Top of the mast of the water and bring it back as part of the race. And you and I know if you learn how to flip a boat, you learn how to not flip a boat. Because the more you learn about how to flip a boat up the breeze and down the breeze, the better you are at controlling its ability to flip. Anyway, scows are wonderful creatures. Good heavens, man. There were no cam action cleats in those days. So we would hold the jib in our mouth during the tack. Jib sheet. And go. <laughs> That's hard on your teeth. I, I, yes, don't Gary, no, I don't recommend that. We Don't try this at home. <laughs> So Gary, when you write a book, I've got to ask some questions. First of all, what would we call this a developmental class like the 14s? Well, the ESCAL, uh, there, there are some parameters. Right now, there's only one build, builder, Melgas. Harry Melgas III is uh, running the company. His dad, buddy, now 92 years old. I think he's a consultant or something. But 
Harry runs it, and that's the only builder, which is a little bit sad because there used to be uh, many, many builders over the years. The scow got going. There, there was an A scow that kind of kicked all this off, which was came out of the Suanta, Suanica Corinthian Cup, which was an international challenge cup for small yachts. And these guys from the Midwest and also Canada showed up with these scow-like boats. And boy, were they fast compared to a keel boat. But scow, you know, they put them on a railroad car to move them around the country, uh, you know, get a horse, horse-drawn carriage to get it to the train, to put it on a flatbed railroad car to move it to regatta. So they weren't practical. So the 28 E 28 foot E scow seemed to be a, a little bit better, more practical size when it came out in 1923. And kind of a fun story. Uh, the boats were introduced when they first came out to Barnicut Bay. Now Barnicut Bay, where I grew up sailing, is kind of shallow. The average depth is four or five feet around the bay. Some spots are even shallower. So the scow with the shallow draft and the flat bottom is the perfect boat. But the, the Barnica Bay Yacht Racing Association, which had only been in operation for a decade at that point, they didn't like the word scow. Scow in Jersey, people thought about those garbage scows coming out of New York and dumping, which is kind of a sad story, all the New York City's garbage out into the Atlantic Ocean. And oh, who, who wants to sail a scow? That's horrible. So they changed the name to sloops. And to this day, 2022, on Bordicate Bay, they're referred to as East Loops, <laughs> not East Gows. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. And if you go to the Bordicate Bay and say, look, why don't you just call it the Scow? Everybody else in the country is called, uh-uh. They, 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 the reference to Scow is, is no good. Gary, can I ask about writing? When you write, talk about your process. So you pick a theme, you decide you're going to write about scows. Do you get a folder and start putting notes, notes, notes in it? Or how do you do it? Do you outline first? What's your process, please? Well, thank you for asking that question, Ron. And I'm sure all kinds of writers have different processes. And all I can say is how I do it and works for me. There's a couple of key things. First of all, when you write something, there's a tremendous amount of reading that takes place in advance. And the characters book, for example, I think I have about 200 sources of material that I've used for this book. And you can't cheat it. You have to read everything because you never know what really nifty nugget is buried in some book that somebody has written. So there's a lot of reading involved. And then I'll take notes and, oh, that's a good story and put all kinds of little file indicators and, and books. And then, then I make a list and I don't put them in order or anything. I just make a list of cool things to talk about. And then I work through the list and uh, spread my papers out. I, I'm a big fan of using yellow pads like that. Make my list and spread them out. And then I try and put them into order. Okay, what should go in the first section, the second section? And you're building an outline at that point. And then at a certain point, I take a deep breath and I start writing. And uh, with books spread all over the place and I chip away one paragraph at a time. It's a slow, arduous process. I don't worry about spelling so much and sometimes there's bad grammar, but the important thing is just get it down on paper. And I will come in here early in the morning. How early is early? 5.36. You know, it depends on the time of year when the sun starts coming up. Uh, I will come down here. And I'm pretty good for four or five hours uh, in the morning. But by noon, my head's a little spinny. And at that point, I go for a good walk and have lunch and come back. And then I go back to what I just wrote and edit and clean up typos and get the grammar right. And, you know, sometimes I, I might say something three times. You know, How did I say that three times? But that's my cleanup time. And then when I get done with that, and that takes a few hours, then when we get done with that, I start preparing and reading for the next day. So the next day I have what I'm uh, writing about. In some days I can be moderately productive with, uh, I don't know, 1,200 to 2,000 words is a pretty good day. And some days I can be unbelievably productive and get three to 4,000 words in a day. 
Uh, so I chip away. And I try not to get hung up. You know, Barack Obama talked about writing his book and he realized he was in trouble when he spent two days on one paragraph. He said, I'm never going to finish this thing. So you do have to move it along. My writing style is, I, I tr you know, I don't pretend to be the greatest writer at all, but I have my own style. I tend to write like I speak. I keep my sentences relatively short. I don't over aggrandize with words, but I like telling the story and the pertinent facts and to move it along. And I try to include things that are somewhat surprising that people don't know. In the characters book, I had to dis discipline myself not to repeat the same story because as time goes on, all these sailors overlap as the years go by. So which the really cool story does it go with Harrishaw or JP Morgan or Charlie Barr? So you kind of have to ferret through and then figure out the priorities, the characters and truth. Every single one of those person people, you could write a book about that. But this isn't a book. So the essays and characters range from three to five thousand words each. Uh, the East Gal book will be a gigantic picture book with lots of great uh, images. The history section is about 20,000 words on the history of the E-Scout class, so not overly long. But the stories, let, let, let me just tell you one that I've discovered. It is so cool. So you can imagine, here, here I am in my office. There, there's my spot. There's my little reading chair there. Notice the globe. And suddenly, the curves cross, and I realized how the E-Scout, the Sawanica Corinthian International Challenge Cup and the America's Cup all dovetailed at the same time. These people knew each other and they borrow ideas from each other. And we've talked about this, Ron, over the years that the America's Cup has a trickle down effect. Things that learn and design and technique end up going to the rest of the sport. But there's also a trickle up effect where things from smaller boats get up to the America's Cup. So here's the story. Nathaniel Green Harrisoff wins the Cup, 1895, very, 1893, 1895, and 1891. His boats, all different boats, different helmsmen, different owners, and he wins the Cup. Now it's uh, 1901, he's got a new boat, uh, and it's quite a contentious series, and it's up against his old boat, Columbia. But Harrishoff is with the new boat, Constitution. And the score is now nine to nine in the final trials. And in the final race, this is the last day you can have a race, his boat wins. Columbia, Charlie Barr, swing it fouls out on the starting lines, disqualified, and loses the race. You know, he loses the race because he's disqualified, but around the course, he loses the race. And the New York Yacht Club America's Cup Selection Co Committee, in their ultimate wisdom, selects Charlie Barr in Columbia anyway. Harrisoff is upset. How can you do this to me? We beat those guys, and I got the faster boat, and you selected those people. But the club had great confidence in Charlie Barr and they were nervous about lifting, and the rumors were that Shamrock 2 was pretty quick. As it turned out, it was pretty quick. And uh, But they thought Charlie Barr could handle it. So Harrisoff declares, I'm done. I'm retired from the America's Cup. I'm done. Good luck to you. And that's it. Well, Charlie, well, Thomas Lipton challenges again. Here he comes. The third time. New York Yacht Club, oh my gosh, it's going to be a lot of money. Again. We got to stop this guy. So Harrishoff goes off and says he's going to go to the Sawanica Corinthian International Challenge Cup, and he's got a nifty design. He goes there, and he shows up. So this is this is 1902, early 1902, and these boats from the Midwest. Holy cow, are they fast? What the hell is that? He says there's some kind of scow, a 51 foot scow that wins the. Corinthian Cup. 
Liv, uh, Harrisoff is kind of intrigued by this, just as Ali Island shows up in Bristol, Rhode Island. Captain, that we need to talk. I know you're retired, but Lifton's challenge again, and uh, we want you back. And Harris says, you know, I've retired, but I have a new idea for a boat. If you let me build the boat that I want to build, I promise you Lipton will never return. <laughs> <laughs> Music to the ears of Ollie Island. You got it. And that's how Reliance was built. Reliance was kind of a scow hull with a basic fin keel. Uh, I think the thing drew 23 feet. It had a mast that was, I believe, 218 feet high. It was 158 feet from the end of the boomkin to the end of the bowsprit, 89 feet on the waterline. So tremendous amount of overhang. 63 crew. You know, just think about that's it. a lot of sandwiches every day. 63 <laughs> crew. And Charlie Barr and uh, Harrisoff made the boat extreme, knowing that if anybody could handle it. It would be Charlie Barr. And that's the story of how Reliance got put together. <laughs> what a magnificent creature Reliance was. Unbelievable. Of course, I've only seen these, all the pictures and models, but as a young kid looking at uh, when the America's Cup was surfacing again in 58, uh, all of us young kids look back at the different models and Reliance always was such a knockout, such an extreme creature. Unbelievable to hear the story. In the case of the East Cows, so the International 14s are a developmental class where they experiment and then decide, you know, what fits and meets the class standard. Mm -hmm. Art, wouldn't you consider East Cows similarly a developmental class? They are. I mean, there's different parameters when you build a boat with a little bit of hole shapes. You're not allowed to have a tunnel hole, which is kind of a catamaran, for example. Um, and, you know, there was little idiosyncrasies between the builders, uh, the Johnson and Melgas boats. Uh, Johnson was from uh, Minnesota and Melgas was from Wisconsin, and they were kind of the premier builders for years and years. And uh, the boats were a little bit different. And I don't know, the Melgas boats maybe were a little lighter and more nimble and the Johnson a little more sturdy. And uh, on Barnica Bay a lot of years ago now, but I sail with the great Sam Merrick. And he had Johnson boats because he thought they were better in the waves. And then later on in life, he got a Melgus boat. So I think it goes back and forth. You know, you don't want a Buick or a Pontiac, you know, it's, it's a little <laughs> idiosyncrasy. So yes, it's a development class. And that's why they uh, encourage these evolutions, these updates and the boats. And they, they kind of evolve as time goes on. The Wisconsin boats, are they built in the Zenda? They are. Uh, I think the name of town is Fontana, but yes, there, there's Zenda, Zenda and uh, Buddy Melgus says it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. He always <laughs> makes that little joke and you know, it, it, Melgus Boatworks, I mean, it's not a big company, uh, right. they, but they sure make good boats, the various scows and uh, Melgus 24s and the Melgus 32s and this 15 footer they have, the 20s, the 15 footer, I, I sure like to see collegiate sailing go in the direction of a boat like the Melgas 15. And the reason is uh, you need a, you get a greater range of weight sailing the boat. Too many colleges in my view have boats that are tiny, 420s and flying juniors. And if you wanna be competitive in a 420 or a flying junior, you've gotta be light. Little. And the skippers are 145 pounds or less, uh, crews are, you know, 95 to 110 pounds. And the problem with that is, so the really good collegiate sailing, you're kind of eliminating people that are heavier. So, you know, for me, it would have been, it'd be tough today, six foot two at the time, not now, 178 pounds, a little more than that, but <laughs> that I'm older now, but, uh, but it, it would be hard to be six two and 178 pounds in a 420. Um, you know, I, I found even back then, you know, I did better in inner clubs or a lark or uh, University of Michigan had 470s, you know, so that, you know, without a trapeze, those could be a handful. 
So I, I think a bigger boat, so you, you know, if you have a small skipper, that's fine, but then that skipper gets a bigger crew. Or if you have a, a big skipper, you, you might have, you can balance it out a little bit, would make collegiate sailing, in my view, a lot more available to more sailors. Because right now, the way college sailing is set up is smaller people that get to compete. So ice boating. Doggone it. I was uh, invited to come out and do some ice boating this last winter, but you had a minimum of, of good weather for ice boating. I kept hearing this. The ice is kind of thin in New Jersey. Talk to me about ice boating. Well, I, I don't know what impact the climate change and global warming will have on ice boating, but it can't be helpful. So I've done ice boating. Uh, very exciting. You know, you got a lot, you go a lot faster than the wind and you can't see what the wind is on the water. And uh, but the boats are exhilarating. And it's great fun racing. Uh, you go long distance, mile and a half, two miles in almost no time at all. And, and the really good guys, uh, Ron Sherry comes to mind, has won the DN Worlds multiple times. Buddy Melgas was one heck of a ice boat sailor, uh, pretty special. And the ice boat sailors, you, you gotta be flexible with your time and schedule. Hey, there's good ice on the White Bear Lake up here in Minnesota. Uh, it's not going to rain. It's not going to snow for the next two days. Boom. Everybody's in their car driving to White Bear and they have the, the championship right at that moment. Because the problem with ice boating is, hey, yes, it has to be cold and you have to have ice on the lake, but you can't have snow on it because if you have the snow, it's hard to go through. And of course, you can't have ice that's melting because you don't want to go through the water at a high speed. That's dangerous too. But ice boating is uh, pretty dramatic stuff. And like I said, I've done it a bunch of times and it's great fun. So. Of, all, of all the things that we think about that we didn't do, and I think about this list often, one of my stupidest moves was not accepting Buddy inviting me to come out to Zen and go ice boating. He kept saying, Ron, these boats that go like eight knots or nothing. Come on, I want to take you 80 knots. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I haven't gone 80, but I think I've gone 60 in an ice boat, which uh, I'll tell you, when your butt is uh, about two inches off the ice and you're kind of laying back and steering and you know trimming this thing with all these harken blocks and i you, you, it gives you an adrenaline rush the fact that it's cold and gray it, that goes away man it it is really cool these boats are, and the, the combined speed you can just imagine you know parallel boards, and you're coming in and you're doing 60 and they're doing 60 and I think I'll give away here. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of speed, foiling. Talk about foiling's impact on sailing. It dates back to the best I know, about 1953, when a couple guys in Lake Mendota, Wisconsin, came up with a boat named Monitor, and they had foils. The boat still exists. It's sent on display at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. And they were able to get this thing foiling and got it going 32 knots or some crazy speed like that. And, uh, and they were very scientific about it. Eventually, the Navy abandoned the project, but that was the earliest foiling I know. But the foiling boats go fast. They are dangerous. You wouldn't want to be hit by a foil if you fell into the water. Uh, we're going to see it in the Olympic Games with the NACRA 17. We're seeing it in the Sail GP. We're sailing it in America's Cup. I mean, who would have envisioned a foiling monohull? That goes right. 45 knots. You know what I mean? It's just Buck Rogers type stuff. But will it gravitate to the rest of the sport? That's a big question. My gut feeling is no. Very hard to operate the boats, hard to launch the boats, expensive. So while there'll be competitions in foiling boats, the moths come to mine and windsurfers and the kite boards. Uh, you know, relatively easy to do in America's Cup. I don't see it becoming commonplace. I ask East Scout sailors all the time, <coughs> well, you can put foils on those things, and that would be a step maybe a little bit too far in their evolution to put foils on it. So I don't know. So on the one hand, cool technology, and the boats go faster. On the other hand, I think limited application. Talk about team sailing, team well, racing. Team racing is very cool. You're right. First of all, you have to be a mathematician because you're constantly adding numbers, even if there's only three boats in a team. <laughs> For first, fourth, and third, can we make it? <laughs> right. right. Yeah, one, four, five wins. Yeah. Um, but you're constantly 
I, I'm just joking. It's it's easy math, but you got to have math in your head. No, it's an intellectual challenge, and there's all kinds of nifty maneuvers. And just because your team has first place doesn't mean you're winning. Because if you're first and they're two, three, and four, and you're five and six, you lose the team race. So you have kind of a this lunge at the end, and uh, the team racers know the rules really well. They're careful. It looks like uh, chaos out there, but it's not. It's uh, pretty well controlled, and people are thinking about it, and it's a team sport. Frankly, I'd put a team race section into the Olympic Games. I mean, just think of Team USA coming into the starting area against uh, Team GBR. I, I think it'd be very exciting and very strategic. And with our younger people, uh, collegiate sailors and more recent graduates, team racing's the thing. That's what they like to do. So you set people set traps, all kinds of maneuvers. Where oh, there's figuring. so many things you can do at marks. And I mean, I, I've done some team racing, and uh, it's great. It's very strategic and and fun. And like I said, you got to be a mathematician and you know, resist the temptation. Oh, good. I'm in the lead. All right. Well, yeah. Well, how's your team doing? And, you know, there's one kind of team racing where whoever finishes last loses the race. So you can imagine <laughs> all the maneuvering going on and, and there, there's a bunch of yelling that goes on. Umpires help make the ruling and the umpires meet with the competitors. So everybody tries to understand what's going on, but things change so quickly. Uh, I have done a couple TV shows on team racing and the best view is a drone directly overhead, looking down and seeing how all the dynamics change. So I think we could see more team racing. And like I said, if you want to improve the Olympic games, there's two things to do. To improve the Olympic games, I would put a team racing in there. Three boats per team, uh, the boats double-handed, I'm not sure what the boat is, doesn't matter. But they're match boats, you draw out a hat, and maybe even switch boats after the first race. Don't make it about the boats, make it about the format in the competition. And secondly, we came so close to a long distance race in the Olympic Games, approved by 76% of our council, approved by all of our board, uh, the member national authorities, I think, well over 75% voted in favor, and we were doing really well. And then uh, an IOC uh, executive member named Sir Ming from Singapore, with the uh, unfortunate encouragement of Paul Henderson from Canada, uh, nixed it. Came up with one reason against this, too expensive, too hard for television. Uh, but the boats are provided, so it's not expensive. And it was amazing that thousands of people around the world were getting into double-handed racing. And you know, the thought of a distance race of four or 500 miles with Stan Honey's tracking, and you could follow this thing 24 hours a day in all time zones. Maybe there's interviews with the crews on board during the race would be kind of exciting. You could race against it like you do in the one day globe or the Volvo ocean race, and you could race in the Olympics. I think it would have brought a tremendous amount of viewership, a lot of new competitors, any size person could do it. Uh, again, it's not about the boat, a simple boat, 30, 33 feet, something like that, two people. It would have been exciting. And we were right there, all approved, ready to go. And, uh, and, you know, the idea, you know, I take credit for helping get the idea going now. And Stan Honey, of course, was a great help because he chaired the Offshore and Oceanic at the time. But it was one of my characters in the America's Cup, Sherman Hoyt, came up with this idea during the 1936 Olympic Games, which were in Berlin. The sailing was up in Keeler Bay uh, in, in northern Germany. And he talked about it. And in 1960, King Constantine, uh, who won a gold medal, in the Olympics, um, he talked about uh, an offshore race. So the idea has been around for 80 years. Uh, and it just seems to me if you have 10 Olympic classes, I'd make one of the medals for team racing and I'd make one of the medals for an offshore and then you can spread the other medals around. You know, in baseball, 
everybody goes to the baseball game, knows the rules. Sailing, the rules change every four years or somewhat change every four years. They do. And there is constant rules clinics and rules classes and rules sessions. What would happen if we just said, okay, stop it, recognize that changing the rules uh, diminishes knowledge about the sport, which ultimately hurts the sport a little bit. So talk to me about this very tough subject of the rules constantly changing. Well, the racing rules of sailing get updated every four years. They actually get updated every year, but the book comes out every four years, which is Olympic quad to Olympic quad. A basic premise of the racing rules of sailing is to keep boats from having collisions. Everything extends from that. And of course, then you want to use the rules to your advantage, which has been going on since the uh, first time there was a racing rule. I think the goal of the racing rules committee is to try and make them understandable, to try and fine tune things. Uh, but boats change. You know, we have foiling boats or catamans racing. And as boats change, the rules have to change a little bit. So as boats change, formats change. Uh, the rules need to follow suit. And you don't learn what the rules should be until you actually go out in the water and practice it. So during one of my terms at World Sailing, I was the liaison from the board to that racing, the Racing Rules of Sailing Committee. So I dutifully sat in on lots of committee meetings. You know, these things go for 10 hours a day or longer. And... Uh, you know, watching the sausage being made was uh, fascinating. You know, <laughs> arguing, does the comma go here or there? <laughs> and uh, what spelling do we use? The British spelling or the American spelling? Or, you know, and, and uh, but these people, they really work hard at it. So yes, if you can make the rules a little simpler and more understandable and consolidate it, that would be good. But I do think updating them periodically in Olympics to Olympics is probably a good format. You know, there was a time where the racing rules were all over the map. The rules you sailed at in San Francisco were the, different than the rules in LA. And uh, there was quite an effort to consolidate the racing rules. And Harold Sterling Vanderbilt gets a lot of credit for that. Harry Anderson's father was involved in it. And to try and solidify the racing rules and he wrote the rule book and then worked hard to get the British to adopt his rules and it was no layup but eventually got it and now today uh, the International Yacht Racing Union which we now call uh, World Sailing came up with rules that are universally used and then U.S. Sailing will publish its own version with its own prescriptions uh, for the U.S., but the rules are a little bit better. But, you know, the basic rule is port starboard, starboard is right away. Windward leeward, windward's got to stay clear. Inside overlap of the mark, inside boat's got to right away. Overtaking boat, it's got to stay clear. Boat tacking, you got to stay clear. But then we go to the America's Cup with these boiling catamarans and we change it. You know, the, uh, the boat uh, tacking has the right of way because <laughs> it takes a long time to tack. So I, I think it's okay to update the rules. I remember years ago, I thought it was U.S. News and World Report showed a statistic that said that the highest athletic GPAs were not from the golf players or the tennis players, but actually sailors. Have you seen any numbers published on the GPAs of, of collegiate sailors compared to the GPAs of other sports? Well, I know at the Naval Academy, which I do volunteer coaching and keep up with. And uh, year after year, the offshore sailing team has the highest grade point average of all the midshipmen uh, and all the sports teams. And the dinghy sailors, I want to say they probably do pretty well, but when you're off traveling every week and it's probably hard to get consistently uh, straight A's all the time, I know from experience. <laughs> you're looking at a solid B guy, you know. <laughs> every now and then I'd get an A. And every now and then I get a C. But I that that three average boy, that was just where I was. <laughs> I, I look back, I probably could have done better, but it was hard, you know. You'd leave at three thirty or four in the afternoon with Friday traffic and 
drive someplace to sail in the regatta and get back Sunday night at 10 o'clock at night. So you didn't study much during the weekends. And uh, I, I think that's hard on sailors. But as a rule, I, I think our sailors do well. And you look at uh, kids coming out of sailing programs, uh, how many go to really good colleges. And first of all, they go to colleges and then they go to good ones and part of active sailing teams. I think it speaks well for our sport. Where is our sport in danger? Talk about threats to sailing or to the game. There's a couple things that are threats to the sport of sailing. Uh, litigation, making insurance expensive. Uh, safety, you know, when we are irresponsible, sending boats out in the thunderstorms is a mistake. Uh, time issues. Everybody's so busy these days. I'm sure you are. And I pretended to retire. What a joke. I'm, I'm busier now than ever. <laughs> uh, the time is a factor. Costs, you know, we're seeing the cost of everything skyrocket. And that's certainly true for uh, sailboats and sails and equipment and moving boats around and the cost of gas. All those things have an impact. So available time, cost of things, litigation, safety, insurance costs, access to the waters. You know, I'm, I'm not sure a lot of people in this country sailors anyway, really appreciate how lucky we are to have these waterfront facilities, our marinas, our sailing schools, our yacht clubs, community sailing. It, can you imagine starting a yacht club from scratch today, getting waterfront property, right? all the uh, requirements with permits and stuff? Virtually impossible. So many of our yacht clubs have grandfathered in use of the water with our docks and moorings and we're lucky and, and we, we need to embrace our yacht clubs and uh, yacht clubs have responsibility to try to make it uh, relatively easy to join, not a brick wall. Everybody should be invited. Uh, we, could, we could do a little bit better in uh, equity um, members, but I, I think most yacht clubs, the doors are wide open to anybody these days. And, uh, it's important, you know, you, you look like a, a guy like Bill Pickney, who's really a hero in our sport, African-American guy. I was shocked to find out he's in his mid eighties. <laughs> I thought he was about 65. And, uh, but you know, he, he's a real symbol, you know, a lot of young kids, Hey, I want to do that too. You know, he went around the world, first African-American to sail solo around the world and very compelling story and out there and. I'm going to be sailing uh, 12 meters this summer. I'm happy to report. We haven't talked about that, but a uh, new owner of the yacht, Courageous. Yeah, Mark and Kimbra Walter uh, bought the boat. They bought uh, some property in Newport, and uh, they look forward to sailing. Uh, they own the, Washington, the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball team, and uh, I think they got part of the Lakers and Rams, too. And... Uh, but most importantly, they bought Courageous. Courageous was launched um, 48 years ago. In 1970, they started to switch from wood boats to aluminum boats. And because of that, instead of doing the cup in three years, they did it in four to give an extra year for the new boat. They weren't sure about these aluminum boats, how strong they were. So the scantlings that were put into place were pretty robust. They didn't want the boats to break apart. But I don't think anybody in 1973 and 74 thought these 12 meters would be sailing around 48 years later. I mean, you look at the long history of America's Cup. You launch a boat, hopefully it wins. It serves as a trial horse. Very rare it goes the second time. Intrepid, 67 and 70, and Columbia, 1899 and 1901. Only times boats have repeated until Courageous came along oh, and Courageous. repeated twice. 74 and 77. But here these boats are still sailing around. So it's good they had stringent scantlings. And I think we're better off for it. So yeah, I'm, I'm planning to sail this summer. And our owners, uh, Mark and Kimbra, I think are going to be, when I've told them this, kind of wide-eyed when they get on the boat. We pull the main up for the first time. We'll have some great racing uh, in the 12 meter class and it speaks volumes. I mean, look, the 12 meter rule has been around since 1907. 
These boats sailed in the Olympic Games uh, three times, 1908, 1912, and 1920. Raced for the America's Cup 10 times between 1958 and 1987. And they're still sailing today. In 2019, we had 23 boats racing the World Championship. Now, the eras of boats change. You know, the Grand Prix are different than what we call the moderns and the classics and the vintage. And, you know, technology came along and design improved. It'd be fun if we got a new 12 meter today. I love sailing courageous in 83 when uh, Black Holler went to the circuit. Bob Billingham and I and some other guys, uh, Rod Davis, we were down in uh, Newport Beach and we were racing the boats, you know, uh, all spring. It was a real, real beautiful, wonderful little adventure, you know, kind of a winter break. Everybody who hasn't sailed 12 meters needs to do just what Gary's saying. They're very tactical. They take a lot of planning on the race course. They're an intellectual challenge, tuning and racing. And my, my job is only as tactician. So I get to uh, I, I get to figure out where we're going on the race course, and other people like Robbie Doyle and others can figure out how to make us go fast, and the combination works. But you can't do everything on these boats. You got to have focus in your job. You're on the foredeck. You're at the mast. You're down below. You're grinding. You're the tactician. You're navigator. Different jobs. Steering, steering. You got to concentrate on those boats. It takes a lot of finesse and concentration to stay with it. And uh, the discussions between the tactician and the helmsman, or the helmsman and the sail trimmers, it, it's fascinating. It, 12 meters last because they're a great intellectual challenge. So speaking of that, it's always seemed like sailing doesn't get as good a rap as it could for how good it is for your brain. You learn all about physics without opening a book. You learn all about weather without opening a book because you actually do it and uh kids who are thinking about downwind angles and how to get you know the best velocity made good are doing it inside their head in a complex way so it's an ideal sport really for um kids who otherwise might seem to be called the term dyslexic that term didn't exist when <laughs> uh, when i was a little kid uh, who knows, I'm sure I must have been. We don't really get as good a rap as we could for how good sailing is for the developmental brains of young people. You're, you're right. And the practical experience is anything in any endeavor when you put your hands on something and do it yourself uh, is superior to what you learn in a book. Not to say you learn from books, but you got to do both of it. Sailing is special. Here's why. You get to do it your whole life from the age of six to the 90 years old, you can go out and go sailing. I mean, this summer, I'll be 72 years old, and I'm a tactician on a 12 meter at the age of 72. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I'm as competitive now as I was when I'm 27, but I'm darn close. <laughs> and I know more. So hopefully I make good decisions. I'm calmer than I was when I was younger. Uh, so, and then you get to meet a lot of really interesting people from all walks of life, and they're very successful in their careers. Uh, we're an environmentally clean sport. We're a team sport. It takes you all over the world. I mean, I, thanks to the sport of sailing, I've been everywhere, from Antarctica to the Arctic to all, all, Asia, I, you name it, I've been there, thanks to the sport of sailing. And, you know, and how do you get to meet really successful people? parentheses wealthy people you don't but in sailing when you're on the boat you're all on the same boat you're all even and and you learn from these people I mean how lucky I got to sail with Ted Turner while he was rising up in his career and telling me how I'll never forget Jobson I'm going to become a billionaire oh really <laughs> okay I'm just happy to pay my visa bill you know how, how are you going to do that well I'm buying up movies I'm going to put on tv and and I'm going to put news on television 24 hours a day. You'll see people watch. Wow, interesting idea. But he's pulled it off. You know, or Larry Ellison, with, you know, the brilliant software guy. You know, it's not by accident that he did so well. He came up with ideas nobody else did before and then drove everybody hard and figured out how to sell it. And, uh, you know, pretty cool. And Nesta Bertarelli is Serona Group you know, pharmaceutical company, they come up with brilliant stuff, the Swiss and uh, in pharmaceuticals. So, you know, we're, we're seeing these people in the sport of sailing and, 
you know, the people have passed JP Morgan, the great financier and buyer and seller of companies, you know, created AT&T, created General Electric with Thomas uh, Edison. And he was into sailing. He loved yachts. He was commodore of the New York Yacht Club. And while he was, you know, he's doing all this stuff. So our sport tends to attract interesting people. It's a sport that you can't guarantee victory. There's curveballs that you can't control. I don't care who you are. I haven't seen anybody yet control the weather. So, and the weather with all the forecasts and all the information we have, there's only something that happens out there on the race course that isn't anticipated. And then the question is, well, how do you deal with it? And that's part of the allure. How do you deal with it? I'm sure like me, Ron, you've had races where you had no business winning and somehow <laughs> you found a way to win. And you had races that were a sure bit and you're in the lead and everything's cool and you don't win. You know, <laughs> things happen on the race course and that's what brings us back. So with that, I have to go frostbiting now. It's, it's 50 degrees out, so it's a relatively good day. It's blowing hard though. I'm going to be exciting on the starting line here. And I have to go racing in Mexorc. This is Banderas Bay, Gary. So I'll be racing out here in a Beneteau 46.1, my boat Ventana that I'll be on. We're racing the Bentley. <laughs> well, it looks like you're uh, staying in a nice pad there. And uh, it looks alluring out there. Although I, I would say in Annapolis, Maryland, at this moment, we have a lot more wind than you do. <laughs> yeah, well, you do. You have more breeze than we're going to have. Uh, one last thing, yacht clubs. Everybody kind of thinks that they might seem to be these snooty environments, but I would make the case that yacht clubs, you know, enhance camaraderie and ultimately help build friendships that last decades. Our friendships in sailing last a lifetime. Exactly. And, and, and people that, you know, you... And that's I mean, good for your health. You do everything you did to kill them. You know, you, you win the race and... Uh, no holds barred. You come back in and talk about it. And if you won, great. You try again next week. If you lose, no problem. You try again a little harder next time and learn about it. But I, I mean, yacht clubs are great at bringing people together and it gives us waterfront access. And that's why, you know, boards of directors really need to, they have a responsibility to optimize these facilities and work hard to get people out on the water of all walks of life. And if we do that, we've done our job.